start now. <laughs> One meeting. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to our village council meeting of Monday, October 10th, 2016. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Yes, uh, Commissioner Milovich Walters. Present. Commissioner Polk. Yep. Commissioner Reed. Commissioner Pavlatis. And Mayor Mahoney. Here. Let's all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You have in your uh, packet this evening a draft of the minutes from our previous meeting on September 26th. Any questions, comments, changes? If not, I'd seek a motion to approve. Second. Second. A motion and a second. Will the clerk please call the roll? Yes. Uh, Commissioner Milovich Walters? Yes. Commissioner Polk? Yep. Mayor Mahoney? Yes. Thank you. Um, recognition, proclamations, appointments, and presentations. We have with mm -hmm. us this evening um, Superintendent Anthony Scarcella to give us an update on the District 118 referendum. Dr. Scarcella. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to thank Mayor Mahoney and members of the Village Council for allowing us a few brief moments to share with you some information regarding our upcoming referendum question on the November ballot. With me here this evening is Justin Lehman, our Chief School Business Official. In August, our Board of Education voted to ask residents for the ability to issue 6.5 million building bonds for capital improvements to our three school buildings. 4.85 million of those proceeds would be used for an 8,000 square foot learning, early learning edition renovations to 1,600 square feet of existing spaces inside improvements at Palos West Elementary School. District 118 operates two targeted early learning programs. These are not universal programs. Students are enrolled in these programs based on set criteria. Our early childhood program serves students ages three to five with special needs, and our pre-kindergarten program serves students ages three to five identified as at risk for failure. Please note that these are district-wide programs both housed at Palos West Elementary School. The need for an addition at Palos West became evident after the school district conducted a year-long study of our facilities, including an external facility assessment conducted by Dr. Re Rebecca Lewis, <coughs> head of the Early Childhood Education Program at Lewis University. Both our internal and external third-party facility assessments found major deficiencies in our current early learning program spaces. In order to provide our youngest, most vulnerable learners with spaces specifically designed to meet their needs, an addition to Palos West was recommended. The presentation from our informational evenings we've been holding to inform our public of our facility needs, which provides much more detail, is in the blue packets that we brought with us that we'll leave this evening. The remaining 1.65 million bond proceeds will be used for boiler and water heater replacements at Palos West and Palos South Schools. Replacement of soft playground surface at Palos West. Energy efficiency projects at all three of our schools. Replacement of a 56-year-old roof at Palos East. And classroom and science lab renovations at all three schools. All 2,000 of our Palos 118 students will benefit from improvements to their schools should this referendum be approved by our voters. Approximately 80% of our residents do not have children in our schools. For them, this most likely will be purely a financial decision. Therefore, it is important to point out this evening that issuing these proposed bonds will not increase or decrease property taxes. The proposed 6.5 million new bonds, building bonds, will replace old bonds that will be paid off this December, at which time the school district will be debt free. That is a rarity when it comes to government, so I'd like to stress that point again. This December, Payless 118 will be debt free. Voting yes will extend for an additional four years the amount residents already pay for debt service. A video on our website at www.payless118.org shows in detail how this referendum will impact our taxpayers. One of our board's five main goals is to manage and plan for financial integrity. I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Beeman to talk very briefly about how we've done so over these past few years. Justin? Thank you. Under the guidance of the school board, District 118 has put itself in a strong financial position. This has been done primarily by controlling expenses. 
District per pupil operating expense, what we spend per student per year, is almost <coughs> exactly the state average. However, when compared to just other Cook County elementary schools, District 118 spends $1,100 less per student per year. Uh, the district spends significantly less per student than what the average elementary district in Cook County would spend. What this means to the taxpayer of the District 118 communities is that their tax rate is lower than most of the surrounding areas. For tax year 2015, D-118 taxpayers paid 3.21%. For comparison, more than 135 and all their commercial property paid just 3.43%. That's a 7% more than 118. And in Tinley Park 146, they pay 6.13. That's 90% tax, higher tax rate than 118. As Dr. Scarcella mentioned, but it's worth reiterating, this referendum will have no increase or decrease in the amount of taxes levied by the district and the taxpayers of District 118 will continue to have among the lowest tax rates in Cook County. So what is the urgency with issuing these bonds? First, these proposed projects are important to the ongoing success of the district. Each of these proposed projects supports the educational goals of the district by either directly positively impacting the student's learning environment or by reducing operating expenses so the district can continue to hold its expenses at lower than average levels. Furthermore, now is an advantageous time to issue debt. Bond rates are near an all-time low, coupled with the district's superb S&P bond rating of AA plus and a short four-year payback period. It is estimated that the district would receive an interest rate of just 1.5% on this debt. Our school board, <clears throat> our school board is committed to full transparency on this issue. This issue. That is why the board decided to issue building bonds. The question on the ballot will provide sufficient detail so every voter walking into the ballot box on November 8th will know exactly what they are voting for. In addition, at Payless West, the capital improvements to our the three buildings. Additionally, we provided all of this information online for public review. We held two informational nights, and we have our last informational night scheduled for, for this Wednesday, October 12th, at 6.30 p.m. at Payless West School. We encourage all residents to attend so that they can make an informed decision come November 8th. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity to share this information with you this evening. The link between strong schools and strong communities is undeniable. We are fortunate to have outstanding in, to have outstanding communities support for our schools, and in turn, we are proud to offer the children of the communities we serve an equally outstanding education. Let me end my remarks by saying that there will be those in our community that may choose to oppose this bond issuance, and we respect their right to do so. We simply ask that they take the time to read over the information we made available to the public on our website, or that they attend our last informational night this Wednesday, if they haven't already done so, in order to make an informed decision. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. We appreciate you taking the time to come here. Thank you. Now we have uh, a dedication to the community house plaque. We. Um, a picture of it's right up there, Mayor. Okay. Um, excellent. The community house, which is now our recreation center, has a wonderful history in Palos Park. The recreation center building, which is also an historic landmark, was erected in 1938 and has been a gathering place for the community ever since. It is important to keep the rich history of the building alive by sharing the story with those that visit. A bronze plaque that tells the story has been placed outside of the building near the display case. Thank you to the Palos Park Women's Club for, don do the, for the donation of that special plaque. Um, the plaque reads, uh, the Community House, 1938. In keeping with the traditions of our early settlers, the Palos Community House stands guardian atop the Village Green. Dedicated in 1940, it is the third building erected on this spot by the citizens of Palos who chose a government based on the villages of New England. Designed in the colonial revival style by Palos architect Edward M. Turtolo, the building was uh, constructed of a locally quarried Athens limestone and is a prime example of the architectural doctrine that, that form follows function. The two-story open concept design allowed this multi-function structure to serve the needs of the community. The community house was home to the village hall, public library, and public and police station. Activities include the Palos School Children's Spring Festival in the 1940s 
grade school graduations, and Friday night teen dances in the 1950s, and the teen center's last resort in the 1970s. Generations of clubs and organizations have met there. Payless Village Players since 1941, Payless Garden Clubs, Payless Fine Arts Association since 1984, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, and the Payless Women's Club since 1940. The Payless Women's Club, founded in 1902, has great presence in the building, both physically and monetarily. In the 1940s, the women met weekly, making crafts to sell at the farmer's markets. Their continued efforts to raise funds supported building improvement projects, an informa informational board at the entrance to the building, a welcome sign for the playground, an updated kitchen, World War II area veterans memorial plaque, facility chairs, funded twice, as well as the initial landscaping. Their largest contribution funded the gazebo on the Village Green, a focus of today's community events. The community house, now known as the Recreation Center, is the operations facility for the Recreation and Parks Department. Just wanted to thank the uh, women's club members uh, who put this sign together. Um, we so appreciate the work that you do um, all year round in our community. Um, and this is just but one example. Um, and it's a, it's a great reminder of the, the works that you do on a daily basis. And I appreciate all that you do. And if you want to have someone from the women's club come and speak to the sign, does anyone want to do that? I didn't prepare a speech, but uh, I just do want to thank you for doing this dedication and to let you know how much this village means to our organization. And, uh, you know, we're very pleased to see this and, um, and know that it is marked as a historic building. And thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. We so appreciate it. I wonder if I could get a photo op. Do we have any photographers? Mike? <laughs> I'll hold down the floor. Feel free to stay, but if you don't, we understand. <laughs> okay. The item on our agenda to, it is to proclaim October 2016 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I am 
I don't always read these proclamations, but I'm going to read this one. Uh, whereas domestic violence is a prevalent societal uh, uh, social problem that not only harms the victim, but also negatively impacts the victim's family, friends, and community at large. Whereas domestic violence knows no boundaries, it exists in all neighborhoods and cities, and affects people of all ages, genders, racial, ethnic, economic, and religious backgrounds. And whereas one in four women will experience domestic violence in her life, and in Illinois, there are approximately 115,000 to 125,000 domestic crimes each year. And whereas for many victims of domestic violence, abuse experienced at home often follows them to the workplace where they are harassed by threatening phone calls and emails. Whereas the health-related costs of rape, physical assault, stalking, and homicide by intimate partners amount to nearly $6 billion every year. And the annual cost of lost productivity in the workplace due to domestic violence is estimated to be hundreds of millions of dollars within nearly 8 million paid workdays lost per year. Whereas through the month of October, the Illinois Coalition Against Domestic Violence and its 52 member organizations will hold numerous events across the state in observance of Domestic Violence Awareness Month, including walk runs, silent witness events, candlelight vigils, and marches. I, John Mahoney, Mayor of the Bayless, uh, Village of Hales Park, to hereby proclaim October 2016 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in the village of Palos Park. Well, I'm just, in case people are taking this apart and listening to it, you know, good month to clean out the attic and give away some stuff. Meet Your Peace is a um, organization, it's a resale shop, and all their proceeds go to the Battered Women's Shelter located in the southwest suburbs of South Suburban Crisis Center. So, one in four. I had to stop when I heard that number. That's a that's a big number. We have no hearings this evening. Consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are routine. They've been brought forward at the direction of the Board of Commissioners and will be enacted with a motion. If discussion is desired, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately. Item A to adopt an ordinance approving a rear yard setback variance 25 South Woodland Trail. The ordinance states village council approves and adopts the findings and recommendations of the Zoning Board of Appeals for an 8.30 uh, foot variation from a 50 yard, a 50 foot rear yard setback requirement for purposes of allowing for construction of a new home. Item B, to adopt an ordinance amending part A, title two, chapter 828, section 828.09, of the Palos Park Village Code in regard to BYOB licenses. The ordinance increases the number of available BYOB licenses by one to accommodate the issuance of a BYOB license to the original Island Sheriff House restaurant located at 12902 South LaGrange Road, Palos Park, Illinois. I will see to adopt an ordinance declaring certain personal property owned by the village as surplus and authorized in the sale of same. The ordinance states the village has a 2004 Mercury Monterey minivan which is no longer necessary or useful and the best interest of the village would be served by the sale of same at next available auction at Richie Brothers and Morrison Illinois for the best price offered. Item D, to adopt an ordinance declaring certain personal property owned by the village as surplus and authorized in the sale of same. The ordinance states the village has a 2010 Ford Crown Vic which is no longer necessary or useful, and the best interest of the village will be served by the sale of same at next available auction at Ritchie Brothers in Morris, Illinois, with the best price offered. Item E, to approve payment of invoices on the warrant list for October 10, 2016, in amount of 91,972.51. Item F, to approve the supplemental warrant list for October 10, 2016, for manual checks, payroll, and recurring wire tra transfers in the amount of $525,579.78. Second. Hearing a motion and a second. Would the clerk please call the roll? Yes, uh, Commissioner Milovich Walters? Yes. Commissioner Polk? Yep. Mayor Mulvey? Yes. Old business. Anyone have any items of old business? Information updates, Public Works and Street Recreation Report. Commissioner Milovich Walters. Thank you, Mayor Mulvey. I have a, a, one item on the agenda tonight that I'd like to address. It's the replacement of our spray assembly for our anti-icer. Uh, Public Works Department has had one truck that's mounted with the sprayer to apply the thermal point 
on the roadways prior to snow removal. Uh, it's a small 150 gallon unit and it was mounted to the back of a pickup truck, but it stopped working uh, late last winter. Rather than purchase the same size unit, uh, Public Works would like to purchase a 525 gallon sprayer that can be easily installed and removed from our dump truck. This will allow longer operation without stopping to refill the tank. Uh, we'd like to purchase this new unit from Monroe Equipment at a price of $8,281, and this money was budgeted in the half percent sales tax fund under operating equipment. Does anybody have any questions? Excellent. Well, then I'd like to make a motion to approve the purchase of the 525 gallon spray equipment from Monroe Truck Equipment at the cost of $8,281. Second. I have a motion and a second one. The clerk, please call the roll. Uh, Commissioner Milovich Walters. Yes. Commissioner Polk. Yes. Mayor Mooney. Yes. Um, at this time, I'd like to, um, do we need to make a motion to move to the next meeting? I'd like to Just move that um, we move the uh, waiving the bidding process uh, to, and accepting the proposal from Rizzo Ford on a police vehicle uh, to our next meeting of the 24th of October. And the reason for that is that the waiving of bid requires four votes when we only had three commissioners available this evening. You just second there? Yes, please. So second. I hear a motion and a second. <laughs> Will the clerk please call the yes, uh, Commissioner Milovich Walters. Yes. Commissioner Polk. Yes. Mayor Mahoney. Yes. And then I just have a few recreation announcements. Um, thank you to everyone who joined the fall visit fishing derby at Horsetail Lake this past Saturday. It was another one of our joint ventures with the Cook County Forest Preserve District. We had 51 registered fisher people, I guess we call them, I don't know. Or just fishers. Fishers, fisher men and women, I don't know. Fishers. Um, but 58 fish were caught, and first and second place prizes were awarded in four different age groups for the largest fish, fish caught. Another great partnership with the Forest Preserves. So, Amen. Yay. Uh, Saturday, October 22nd, we are hosting Western Night Lion Dance and Dinner at the Recreation Center. Yeah. Uh, dinner consists of hog wild pork chops, big chicken sides, and desserts and beverages. So if you haven't had hog wild, this is a great time to try them out. They're awesome. Call and make your reservation, $30 a person, and it'll sure be fun for everyone. Saturday, October 22nd. Uh, yes, it's over on Cicero, the actual restaurant. Um, great mac and cheese. Not that everything else isn't great, but the mac and cheese is really good. Um, but then you can line dance and dance off the food and not, you know, worry about how much you ate. Uh, also, mark your calendar for our Halloween parade and party Thursday, October 27th, starting at 6 p.m. at the Recreation Center. It's $3 if you pre-register, $5 if you show up at the door. There's prizes, candy, game, and a spooky good time. And we'll be judging uh, the parade of children outside again. It's a lot of fun, so please bring your child along. Uh, registration is open for our winter youth basketball league for grades grades first through eight. Both boys and girls teams are forming now. Call the recreation center to sign up today. And space is still available for the fresh wreath creation at Pilcher Park Greenhouse with lunch and a shopping trip. And that's Monday, November 21st. There's only 12 tickets available, so call or reserve your spot today. Um, again, that's lunch and shopping trip, but it's learning how to create a fresh wreath. So that's kind of cool right before the holidays. So uh, also don't forget the rec center is available for holiday rentals. Uh, we can have rooms to accommodate up to 100 people. Just call us at 708-671-3760 for more information. If you have any other questions, call that number. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Building a public property report. Commissioner Reed is absent this evening, so I'm gonna uh, read his report. Autumn home maintenance. As the leaves change and the days get shorter, take time this autumn to prepare for the oncoming cold weather. This means, of course, change air filter and furnace, replace batteries and smoke detectors, inspect and clean gutters. I uh, just did that this week. Empty mm -hmm. unused gasoline and lawnmower, chimney sweep, inspect and clean gutters. Ooh, that's on there twice. It's, it's that, really important. It's that important. It is. It's a two-story house. I'm just going to say, and I, want, I don't want to repeat myself. <laughs> Rake leaves, disconnect garden hoses, test emergency backup generator. Remember, when hiring a contractor to do work at your home, please make sure that they are registered with the village. Call the building department at 708-671-3730 to verify the contractor. 
Works Register. The building department processed 21 permits uh, during the most recent period, resulting in $9,813.35 of permit fees. We saw kind of a rush to uh, get some things moving before the snowfly. Before we face this supposedly, I've heard twice now, farmer's alm almanac type of stuff that we're going to have a very cold winter. So It'll probably snow. Or not. Or a good sprayer. There you so, go. Uh, yeah. That concludes Commissioner Reed's report. Public Health and Safety, Commissioner Paul. Thank you, Mary Mahoney. Uh, the police activity report, 25 September through 9 October 2016. 1,062 calls for service, 23 adjudication tickets, 25 traffic tickets, an additional 26 case reports, arrested five adults, fortunately no juveniles, impounded four vehicles, did uh, 12 senior checks, an additional 23 citizen assists, and 31 community contact hours. So that's what the uh, Palos Park Police Department's been up to for the last couple of weeks. And then I have a couple of uh, announcements. Um, the first regards our uh, relationship with um, Southwest Central Dispatch. Southwest Central Dispatch are the group of individuals who take our emergency calls. When you call 911, you don't get the uh, friendly people at the desk here in Palos Park. You get Southwest Central Dispatch, and they 24-7 uh, are the people who uh, direct uh, our officers to uh, their particular responses. They're undergoing a assessment in terms of uh, additional accreditation. And as a part of that assessment, there will be the opportunity for the community to um, uh, address uh, the agency, their ability to comply with their particular standards and anything else you might have on your mind. So this is a little unusual because you don't have to be at the meeting in order to be able to give your comments, but you do need to have a telephone. On Tuesday, October the 25th, 2016, between the hours of 1 and 3 p.m., you can call the assessment team. How cool is that? You call the assessment team, you can make your comment, leave it, bing, bang, bum. So if there's people listening at home, want to jot this down, 708-448-9391. 708-448-9391. Tuesday, October 25th, Hours of 1 to 3 for uh, input into the assessment team that is looking at accreditation for Southwest Suburban Dispatch. If you have any other questions, dpolk at palospark.org. Drop me an email and I'll be happy to respond. You can also leave me a message at the village where through the magic of electronic God knows what somehow shows up to me as a message on my email. That's pretty cool. It works. Um, and then I have a couple of other quick announcements. Um, the first has to do with uh, transparency, particularly police department transparency, since that's what I'm charged to represent, um, as it pertains to community trust. So this is in response to the president's call to action in order to be able to provide more access to open data to try and hopefully increase the trust between police and citizens. And Palos Park, the Palos Park Police Department is going to follow the Palos Park, I'm sorry, the Police Data Initiative uh, by uh, providing open data to give the community a picture of what it is that we do, but more importantly, to give you actual specifics on things like our officer information. Who are they? When were they hired? What their particular race, gender, and education are, so more background about our officers. All traffic stop data, which is collected under the Illinois racial profiling data or collection requirements. So we'll tell you who we're stopping, what they're doing, what they look like. All pedestrian stop data, again, collected under the Illinois pedestrian stop data requirements. And then finally, bi-weekly community engagement reports, giving you the date, time, location, and the officer who was involved in any particular community engagement activity. So this will be available to you, uh, open up on our website, and if you want to stop in, we'll be happy to direct you to how you can access that particular data. But again, this is yet another in a continuing series of efforts that we have to try and make our department as transparent and open as possible.
So we use a lot of social media to keep people informed of what's happening in real time in the park. But for those people who don't follow on social media or don't particularly have the time to be able to do those things, this is another way in aggregate that you can take a look and see who it is that we're involved with and who it is we're stopping and who's doing the voodoo that the police department do so well. Do you have any other comments you want to make on that, Chief Miller? Uh, just to add forward some communication from uh, the Department of Justice, we'll be the first police department in the state of Illinois to implement the police data initiative. I did that on purpose. So the first police department in the state of Illinois to release that information and disseminate it in this particular fashion. So there you have it. Um, and then uh, finally, I want to talk about uh, we believe in education and training for our department. And as part of that, on October the 18th, we're going to take a look at preparedness and response by um, doing another one of our series of disaster and emergency preparedness drills. Um, the scenario involves uh, simulated disaster or emergency, situ emergency situations, um, is a mock exercise, and really helps us to focus on not only what we do well, but what we might be able to do better and what we should be doing better. So again, that will occur on October the 18th. Anything you'd like to add to that? No. We don't reveal we don't what reveal the anything. we don't reveal we don't reveal Jack until it happens. So there you have it. And uh, unless Chief Miller has anything he wishes to add, welcome back from Washington. Um, uh, that concludes my report. Thank you kindly. Uh, accounts and finances. Commissioner is absent this evening, and I don't think we have any report. So that will lead to my report. And I just, uh, uh, this could be an announcement, but I just wanted to uh, do a commercial for Payless Reads, which is a, uh, um, an event that is sponsored by our own Payless Fine Arts and our local libraries. I'm trying to think, is there anyone else that sponsors that? This is an event that will be held this Wednesday, October 12th at 7 p.m. The, at the Payless Country Club. And um, it's where a, an author is invited to speak about uh, his or her book. This year's book is The Book of Unknown Americans. It's a novel by Christina Enriquez. Um, and I am pretty darn close to finishing this book. I will definitely have it done by Wednesday. And it's, it's a terrific read. I, I read quite a few pages today. So, uh, great event. It's a free event. I want to emphasize that. There's an opportunity to buy books and get it signed by the author. Um, a terrific local event. I, I truly enjoy uh, author events. And, and this is one in our own backyard. And it's free. So, that concludes my report. Clerk Aragoni. I think we had a senior meeting this morning? Yes, we did. Uh, we had a real nice crowd. And um, in keeping with the theme of Halloween, we had a, a gentleman come in, Stephen Frenzel is his name, and he did a presentation on uh, movie monsters. And uh, it was really a lot of fun. I think the people enjoyed it a lot. Um, Dracula, Frankenstein, the, how they've, uh, I guess the Dracula movie is like 90 years old, and yet. <laughs> Nothing's ever topped it, and uh, he did Frankenstein, which is they did not refer to him as a, it was it, but um, you almost felt sorry for him because they did a, another movie, The Bride of Frankenstein, and of course when she meets him, needless to say, <laughs> she screams and all, and she gets really afraid of him, and Frankenstein realizes that nobody will ever love him, so he blows up the place, and that's the end of this. The whole story. Nice. Yeah. So, Not every story has a happy no. ending. Was, yeah, you kind of felt. I mean, you kind of felt sorry for him. But it was. It was really a fun presentation. People really got into it. And what was interesting is the men liked it more than the women did. I don't Go know figure. why, but they did. But anyway, it was. It was a good day. But um, and I have. Do we have some announcements here? Um, the zoning board of appeals will not meet this Wednesday. Uh, the Police Pension Board will hold their quarterly meeting Monday, October 17th at the Captor Center. The Recreation Advisory Commission will meet Tuesday, October 18th at the Rec Center. The Historical Historic Preservation will not meet on Tuesday, October 18th 
and the library board will meet on Wednesday, October 19th at 7 o'clock. Cook County has announced early voting begins October 24th and runs through November 7th at approximately seven or 50 sites in Cook County. Uh, the closest one for us would be the Payless Hills Community Center, 8455 103rd Street in Payless Hills, and Orland Township, 14807 Ravinia. Uh, if you want a ballot met, sent to your home or other address, mail the ballot application here at the Captor Center. Okay, the Plan Commission has scheduled a public hearing on Thursday, October 20th at 7.30 in the Council Chambers to consider the following, 7919 West McCarthy Road, Bank, Payless Bank and Trust as trustee of Frank Radichowski, who is requesting a zoning map change from R1A, one family dwelling, to B2 General Retail and Wholesale Business District, and a commercial construction and landscaping review request to construct a 43,769 square foot medical office building on that property. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Manager Bay. Just have one uh, matter for the council to consider. Uh, this is to approve an intergovernmental agreement between the Village of Pales Park and the Village of Orland Park for funding certain median modifications along 131st Street. Um, this is the area on the east side of LaGrange Road along 131st Street. A, a barrier median was um, started to be put in uh, by the state and their contractor. Uh, the village uh, of Palos Park and Orland Park, the mayors met, uh, discussed this and uh, took some action. Um, there, that action is uh, resulting in work starting today. Uh, part of the median was removed, um, but this is how we fund it. And the funding uh, uh, agreement arrangement has been that the Village of Palos Park will front end the money. Uh, we will then um, get reimbursed 50% from the Village of Orland Park. Orland Park did pass uh, this agreement at its October 3rd Village Board meeting. So I'm just looking for approval of this agreement. Good. Just want to thank uh, Mayor McLaughlin for click quickly taking our meeting and um, seeing and understanding uh, the situation and agreeing to work together on a change. I was, uh, I was very pleased uh, and thank you for staff for working through all the details in a quick manner uh, given the uh, quick approaching end to our construction season to get this on the, uh, our agenda this evening. I'd like to make the motion to approve the intergovernmental agreement between the Village of Peels Park and the Village of Orland Park for funding certain meeting modifications along 131st Street. And I have to say, I am impressed with how fast. I really didn't think they would get started so quickly. And I know that, that heading east, there was no way to make a U-turn anywhere. And so this will be great. Sorry. Second. Motion or second motion, please call the roll. Yes, uh, Commissioner Milovich Walters, yes. Commissioner Polk, yep. Mayor Mullen. Yes, thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Uh, I have uh, one announcement, um, and that is I'd like to uh, make everyone aware of the uh, McCord Gallery and Culture, Cultural Center uh, event, The Splendors of Spain. Uh, the volunteers at McCord are hard at work planning this year's annual fundraiser for the love of the arts. This year's theme is the Splendors of Spain and will take place at the Midlothian Country Club on Saturday, November 5th. As always, the event is open bar with a full dinner. Please join us as we spend an evening in Spain featuring classical Spanish guitar <coughs> play by David Churiboga, along with flamenco dancing presented by Leticia Adrovena. And not to be missed, the hot Latin sounds of Contrabanda. Lead, led by Grammy-nominated percussionist, Danny Howard. I <laughs> wondered <laughs> <laughs> that. Uh, this gala, annual gala has become a trademark event. This is our major annual fundraiser and helps us to continue to operate the historic or Hope Courthouse, offering classes, exhibits, and special cultural programs to the greater Chicago Southland region. 
For tickets, information, or to be a sponsor, please call 708-671-0648 or visit our website at www.accordgallery.org. Um, Accord's doing a new addition. They're well on their way to uh, getting that complete, hopefully by the end of the year. And this is another uh, fundraising event to help them in their many endeavors. I will be there. Uh, and what's the announcements? Citizens and visitors count up here. Anyone from the audience like to address the council at this time? Mr. Gacious? Thank you, Mayor, Commissioners. Last week when I was taking my brother to the train station, it was still dark out in the morning, and on a driving on southbound 86th Avenue heading to the train station, I barely noticed a jogger jogging down the street. He was wearing dark clothing. And on the way to this very meeting tonight, about the same spot, there were two people wearing dark clothing riding horseback on the uh, southbound lane of 86th Avenue. And all I ask of people in the village who ride horseback or who jog or walk whatever different on our roads at nighttime when it's dark to please wear light colored clothing or if you can gain access to them, those fluorescent vests that you see traffic personnel wear. Uh, you get a lot of drivers who drive recklessly around here these days, either people texting on their cell phones, talking on their cell phones, or doing whatever, or maybe not paying attention yet after coming home from a bad day at work or whatever. And uh, it increases the risk of, let's say, something terrible happening when you have all those things mixed together, dark clothing and reckless driving. So I guess I ask those who engage in activities on our roads like riding horseback or jogging, walking, to please wear light colored clothing so that motorists can see you easier. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, Mike. I would just add to that, slow down on streets like that where you don't have good visibility because of the hills. Um, lots of people are trying to go use 86th Avenue to get to the LSAT Trail. Um, just try to be safe. Anyone else like to address the council? Yes, sir. We'd just like to uh, come to the podium and announce your name for the, the record. Yes, my name is Jim O'Hare. Uh, I've been a resident of Palos Park for 37 years, and I've never felt the need to attend a council meeting during all that time because I consider it to be a very well-run village. I, tonight, I felt compelled to attend. And let me preface what I have to say by complimenting the school board, its president, Mr. Faustino, the superintendent, Mr. Scarcella, for the dedicated effort I watched them uh, perform over the last couple of months on this debt bond issue, which is going to be on the ballot November 8th. But let me take it back a year around Thanksgiving time. Between Thanksgiving and New Year's Eve, well, let me say this. The board passed a working cash bond for $6.5 million a year ago. Okay. And the, if nothing happened within 30 days, that bond would have been a done deal. And that $6.5 million that they're asking for today would have already been approved. The only way to, to have brought that issue to the November ballot was if we could collect signatures from 10% of the voting population in the district, which amounted to about 1,550 signatures. Because of the dedicated efforts of 20 volunteers calling on their fellow citizens door to door, knocking door to door, during the whole holiday season, during the 30-day period, they had to collect the petition signatures. This referendum will be on the ballot November 8th. A month ago, I witnessed, I attended a school board meeting in which they canceled what they had approved and minutes later issued a new type of bond, a construction bond as opposed to a working cash bond, which needs to be put on the ballot automatically. And they did that, in their words, in the interest of uh, uh, honesty and, uh, I guess, uh, Transparency is the word that, that uh, was used. Okay. At our volunteer
volunteers, Matt Fleckman's signatures, this would have been a done deal. We wouldn't even be on the ballot or be voting on it. Your right to vote and the citizens of the village, Bailiff's Park of Bailiff's Heights, were rewarded with the right to vote on this referendum on November 8th. Now, the proposed loan amount of $6.5 million, $6 million is comprised of the following expenditures. And correct me if I'm wrong, Superintendent. Four classrooms at a total cost of $3.25 million. And if you're good at math, that equates to $812,500 per classroom for each of the four classrooms. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen an $812,500 classroom. And I'd really be interested to see what one looks like. In addition to the $812,500 for each of those four classrooms, a $600,000 expenditure for construction of a more convenient drop-off location uh, in the uh, parking area for the students to, to uh, disembark. Uh, these are handicapped students in the early childhood program, and no one supports the need to provide excellent education to those students and to help them get their life started on the right track. What, what I do believe is that the expense is excessive and that they have not justified to me, and I think to many of the citizens, what the expenditure will buy. Okay? What sticks out of my mind most is the $812,000 per classroom cost. And I, I guess I have a question because I think it's a want versus a need. And I admire, again, the efforts of, of the school board to provide this education. But what I'd like to know is, have we talked to more than one architectural firm you know, to get an estimate of competitive cost projections? The only architectural firm that I've heard that provided you with these numbers is the Y Construction Company. Have we solicited projections from other Architectural firms are just dealt with why. Mr. O'Hare, th this is not really <laughs> intended to be a question and answer okay. session. That's probably uh, next Wednesday, or this coming Wednesday is probably a, a good forum for that, where right. President Scarcell and all the board members. Like I said, I'm a rookie at this. No, not at all. We, we appreciate a. Uh, I, I watched the. Involvement, engagement in the democratic process is a good thing. I watched the formal presentation twice which was designed to justify the expenditure by taxpayers. And my conclusion is that the justification that they are using is number one, too much time is spent <coughs> moving children, three to five year olds, to the bathrooms and back again. And that too much valuable teaching time is lost. And the second one is that more storage space is needed. Now in my mind, you know, $4.85 million, $3.25 for classrooms, $600,000 for the <coughs> parking uh, drop-off area, and another million dollars to renovate and reconfigure four kindergarten classrooms is pretty excessive. And that I think there should, you know, be much stronger justification for that need and more options explored to justify the expenditure. So, we were told that our taxes won't be increased because the current bond issue, which they had issued four years ago, is being retired. Okay. So it's a wash. Taxes won't go up. Uh, their estimate, their projections are that uh, each taxpayer with a house assessed at $300,000 uh, will pay a roughly $192 a year for each of the, four, the next four years. That's $768 over the four year period for a home assessed at $300,000. You know, $500,000 home, you're gonna pay more, okay? My question is if we could get a more uh, reasonable cost for what the board wants to accomplish, you know, perhaps we have a unique idea, reducing taxes somewhat. Mm. Okay. So it's your decision to, your decision to uh, make it in the ballot box, in the ballot booth, in the voting booth on uh, November 8th, and 
You were provided that right by the volunteers who worked their whole holiday season last year to get it to the ballot. Thank you for your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. My name is John Donovan. I'm a resident of Davis Park. Uh, I want to talk to everyone about the District 18 proposal. Um, I appreciate the gentleman who just spoke coming up and laying out the numbers. I've been to all the board meetings. I have listened to all the presentations. I have read through all the materials and limited and very little that they've actually put out. And the case just isn't there for it. But I was one of those people who went and knocked those doors to get 12% of the registered voters in the district signatures to put this in the ballot. I've heard the school board say plenty of times that they believe in transparency. Well, let's be clear about this. They didn't come to the decision of putting this on the ballot on their own. They were forced to by the long hours put in the winter time by volunteers and the people who opened their door for everyone to hear. Instead of taking that ballot, they struck it, approved a new one, and that question there, when you read it, isn't actually honest to what the plan says. $3.25 million will go to classrooms. Zero of those dollars will go to programming. And a quarter of that $6.5 million will go to other pet projects that they've laid out that are not mentioned in that question that you will read on that ballot. Now, they don't, they'll tell you about Tinley Park and Orland Park. As Taylor's Park residents, there's a big difference. We don't have a commercial tax tax. Your, your property taxes pay for everything here. So that's a lot of money to come from your property taxes without the benefit that Tinley Park and Orland have with the commercial center. So it's easy to say that you know, you're lower than over there and, and these things, but keep that in mind that this is coming from your home. And keep in mind that for 50 years, they've always slipped this in without coming to you and asking you how your money should be spent. It wasn't until, and they didn't think it was going to happen, it wasn't until we went and knocked those doors that we got this on the ballot for all of you to have a say and make the determination how you want your dollar spent. This would have been slipped through again in a backdoor way without you knowing. On top of that, there's no free lunch, so don't let anyone tell you that. Someone's paying for this at the end of the day. Someone pays for everything that government does. So the question to that is a rhetorical one here that they haven't made the case for, but is who's paying? They'll tell you your taxes aren't going up, it's not going down, but at the end of the day, if they don't put this through, they're not borrowing that money anymore. That, that's a decrease. Sure, they're filling a gap. You, there's, they say you won't notice a difference because they're filling what they've done for 20 years this way uh, till the last time that they challenged and started using this loophole. But at the end of the day, if this is not approved, that money is not there, and that will no longer be on your tax bill. That's a decrease. When you eliminate an expense, and a debt obligation is an expense, that's a decrease. So, like I said, I've read all these things. The case isn't there for it. They're not being genuine in how they're portraying what they're telling you that they're going to use it for. And this wasn't their decision to put it on the ballot. It was you, the taxpayers and voters, who signed that signature that forced them to do it. They've never done that before. So I strongly urge everyone, early voting starts on October 24th, November 8th is the election. I urge everyone to go out there and take advantage of that, of those long hours that people did. Because the board didn't give you that chance. Your neighbors and your friends and your grandkids and the other people in this area, they did. Because you have a right to determine how your money is spent and when they choose to take it. So I just want to you know, thank everyone for that, and I hope that that's clear. And I want to just call one last attention. I think the previous gentleman did a good job. 800, almost $815,000 for a classroom. There are homes, one-acre homes in Taylor's Park that are $800,000. I've been watching all the for sale signs in this area. I've been watching the prices on those homes. They're going for $600,000. And they're going to spend $815,000 on one classroom? Ask yourself if that is someone being a good steward of their money. Because that's what this comes down to. These are individuals who are stewards of their money. And they're not answering the questions, and they're not answering the, those type of dollars and cents. It's time for everyone else to make that determination. We have the opportunity this year. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to address the council? 
Please. like to address the council? Yep, this gentleman. My name's Ron Field, 8506 West 119 Place. I'm just curious, I talked with Mr. Reed, who was here today, about having your fence ordinance amended so that the village would only accept surveys that have actual measurements on them. I'm wondering if any action has been taken on that because the survey that was presented by one of my neighbors who wrecked the fence seven and a half feet into my yard had no measured surveys on it and it was in essence uh, just a, you know, a rehashing of the, you know, the recorded numbers on his deed. Laura, I don't know, if that, has that been discussed at all? Um, we did. I believe we did talk about it. Uh, if you mentioned it with Daryl, we do require um, surveys. Yes, the survey re you accepted <laughs> had no actual measurements on it. It was more or less just a plot of survey with recorded numbers on it. During the survey of Pinabuddy property, uh, one of the less uh, knowledgeable surveying companies stuck a stake seven and a half feet off the, of my rear property line. And that stake was used as a measurement for this fence. Had actual measurements been required, the error of that seven and a half feet would have surfaced before the fence permit was issued. And now there's gonna be great expense in removing that fence and the legal work that goes after that. So what I'm asking the board to do, just like they do with other construction, is require actual measured surveys. Okay. Thank you. And I'd like to be informed when that happens. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you. Oh, one other thing. Mm. This gentleman wonders what happens if this bond issue is the past. I remember about 20 years ago, there was a bond issue that was on the ballot three times and rejected by the citizens of District 118. So the school board uh, <coughs> passed a 
find their shoe on their own without the consent of the taxpayers. And several of us went around trying to collect the 1,600 signatures necessary to uh, overrule the school board. Unfortunately, we only got about 1,400 because we weren't made aware of this by the time the legal uh, petition was put together. We only had about 22 days to collect signatures. So that's what your school board will do for you. If you don't pass it, they'll shove it up your butt another way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Maria? Maria Rogers, 120, 21, South 93rd Avenue. I'd like to congratulations Mr. for Donna Hunt for the wonderful job they've done, all the gentlemen, all the people that want to run and collect the petition. But I want to tell uh, the council and I want to tell Mr. Donna that Mr. Bill already took, I mean, I took care of that. So we, but for the last, it's not been one time that the, the, I mean, the bond issue went on um, the school board. We all, there was a bunch of us, a bunch of residents, we all over went around and collect position. But the school board, all women took the time to make sure that they, they denied this petition, they scrutinized, they had their lawyer, they spent so much money to get lawyers just to defeat those petitions. And all of us, there were about 10 of us when I ran a collect petition. Every time there was that I ran. At this, I would like to bring congratulation in him to die for being so successful to get an about issue. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Anyone else like to address the council before we close the meeting? If not, I would seek a motion to adjourn at this time. Second. Second. Okay, motion and a second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you all. Good evening. Be safe out there.